Okay, looks like there's still some people trickling in. So we'll give them a couple more minutes to get in. Uh, but welcome to the spring 2021 uh, information session. Um, so I'm just going to ramble a little bit while everyone shows up. Um, but basically, uh, what we're trying to talk about today is sort of introduce what energy for exploration is and as well as what all of the various projects are. So you're gonna hear from uh, all of our projects, all the uh, projects that we're currently running uh, within engineers for exploration today. And um, we'll hear a little bit from our uh, PIs or the professors that are actually uh, heading up the uh, research group. And you hear a little bit about kind of what the motivation for, uh, you know, why, Engineers for Exploration is a thing and what, what we're trying to, you know, what kind of opportunities there are for US students to get involved in research, get involved in uh, the projects that we do work on. Um, so let's give people a couple more minutes to get in. Um, presenters, one thing, uh, if you had uh, the media in your slides, let's make sure I have access to uh, present those. Thanks. Nathan, do you want to just go to the next slide and I'll talk a little bit and then um, as I ramble, people will come in and then we can get started, I think would be a good thing to Sure, we can do that. Okay. Um, so welcome again. Uh, as Nathan said, we're uh, the engineers for exploration team. Um, we have uh, about 10 projects that are ongoing right now. Um, and currently about 40 to 50 students that are working on these projects uh, in various aspects. Uh, so the, the way that the, the program is organized is that um, each project uh, has a number of uh, mentors uh, that are assigned to it. Or um, the first and kind of the most important is the scientific mentor. Um, and that's the person that um, essentially gave us the problem. Um, so they, these are people from like the San Diego Zoo, um, or archaeologists, uh, people from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So they've, they've come to us in one way or another and said, we have this issue that we'd like to try to, uh, we'd like you, for you to solve or help us solve and use uh, modern technologies to solve those, so these problems. Um, so for each of the projects, we have the scientific mentor and they really drive the, uh, the, the project, right? They tell us, uh, here's what we want as, as scientists. You know, they're almost a customer, um, but they are a customer in some sense to each of the projects. And then who you'll be hearing from today are the project leads. And these are the, the people that have been working on these projects typically for a year or more. Uh, so they have a lot of experience in, uh, in all aspects of the projects. And they would be the, the person that you would be interacting with uh, uh, a lot if you decided to choose one of these projects. Um, and, uh, and then we have uh, other mentors. So Nathan, um, who does a lot of the sort of uh, keeps things running and uh, makes sure things are moving and uh, supplies are ordered and uh, picks up the slack uh, when there's some deeper technical skills that we need. And then uh, myself, uh, I'm, a, I'm one of the uh, directors and, and founders, co-founders of this program. It started almost 10 years ago. Um, again, with the goal of trying to help scientists to develop, use technologies, use modern technologies in order to, uh, to solve their problems. And then Kurt, uh, I don't know if Kurt is here. Kurt Sugars is the other uh, director. Um, he's a professor at ECE. Uh, and the two of us uh, are, are basically here to uh, try to facilitate your projects, make you successful, uh, allow you to interact with scientists and things like that. Um, so uh, a couple of examples here. Um, so what we'd like to do in the projects, um, they're real world projects. So the things that people get tend to get out of this program are um, showing how you can use the skills and uh, knowledge that you gain in your classes, um, using those in, for real world uh, issues to solve real world problems. Um, so we, uh, uh, we, we like to go on expeditions when we can. Um, so many of the projects have that aspect to it. So uh, on, the, on the left there is an expedition. Uh, well, that's just to the Anza Borrega Desert, to the mud caves. But we were developing a uh, 3D imaging platform um, that could image large caves or tunnels. And then the uh, more exciting aspect of that project, which uh, Giovanni will present later, 
uh, would be going to Guatemala to work with an archaeological sites in Guatemala uh, that uh, kind of look like those caves. So that was a proxy for us um, in order to scan these caves. And then on the right there, um, you can see uh, Kurt looking like his badass self um, with a drone from a few years ago. I believe this is in uh, Belize. Um, yep. And so, and at this point, Kurt was uh, out there with uh, scientific collaborators trying to find uh, um, harpy eagles and, and other things. So using drones um, or uh, and cameras and things like that to do large scale surveys and try to understand the ecosystems in the jungles there. Um, so Nathan, maybe you go to the next one. I have no idea what's next. So this will be uh, this will be exciting for me to figure out. Oh, right, good. Um, so uh, I think without further ado, unless Kurt has anything to say, and that, maybe I'll just let Kurt uh, end the end the presentation so he can say whatever he wants at the end. Um, we're going to go into these projects. Here are the ongoing projects that we have. So these are the projects that were uh, are currently uh, in progress, and these are the projects that uh, we're hoping to try to find more people to participate in. Um, so the goal for us today is to give you a flavor for what these projects are, uh, but also tell you what sort of uh, things we want to do this quarter and beyond, um, and what sort of skills that um, are needed for these projects. Um, so, uh, and keep in mind those skills aren't necessarily skills that you have to have at this point, but are skills that you are willing to learn. Okay? And that's a big thing with a lot of these things is that you should just be excited um, about the project and you should be excited to try to learn more about all of the things that you need to uh, to do to build these things. They'll probably be a, a, a bit scary at first, uh, but that's fine. Um, we'll, we'll slowly uh, allow you to kind of uh, be a part of the project and uh, make you successful. We've done this a few times before. So the biggest thing is is your excitement and your willingness to put some time into all of these things. And if you have that, we've we've seen in the past that you will be very, very likely be successful in this program. Um, so uh, the rest of the the the, uh, the presentation, uh, except at the end, is going to be our project leads. And like I said, each of the project leads will just give an overview of the project and talk a little bit about what we want to accomplish uh, this quarter. Feel free to ask any questions in the chat um, or raise your hand, or if you'd like to interrupt, if you're so bold, you're welcome to do that any, any sort of way to ask questions. And, and I'll help monitor and answer those questions. So I'm sure others will do that in the chat. Uh, but let's uh, let's get started uh, with the presentations, I think. Okay, so first up is Narek with the Coral Tile project. Hi everyone, I'm Narek. I'm the project lead for the Coral Tile. Um, first, I'd like to maybe uh, go through what brought on this project and then I'll uh, go through what the project is and what kind of contributions you can make to it if you join. Uh, so next slide. Uh, next slide again. So. Uh, this is the 100 Islands Project, uh, the 100 Islands Challenge, my bad. Uh, it's an effort spearheaded by the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, uh, and their mission is to track changes in coral reefs using 3D cameras to digitally archive coral reefs uh, every few years so that they, they can track those changes. And what they, what they do is they use these uh, underwater 3D mapping cameras um, that create mosaics of coral reefs, like you uh, just saw there. Um, next slide. So there's there's a, a few challenges. Oh, looks like it's playing again. So there's there's a few challenges uh, associated with with doing this uh, 100 Islands project, uh, 100 Islands challenge. And um, one of those is that the the camera system isn't able to supply geolocation data for the 3D mapped reef. Um, so they have to do everything manually. They have to they have to locate everything manually by setting up markers in a specific pattern oriented with the shore, and they have to use a GPS uh, reference marker to kind of pin down those locations. Uh, and then after the fact, it has to be cardinally um, aligned, uh, and that's that's the best approach that's available now. But it has some problems. Uh, the process itself isn't the most precise. Uh, if if uh, if you want to take depth measurements, which you have to do in order to locate these precisely, uh, you have to go down with a dive computer, which is it's like a dive watch, but it shows you the, the pressure on an LCD screen. Uh, you have to go down there and you have to like remember the, the, the depth or, or record it somehow. And it's, it's prone to human error. It's, it's, not, it's not really a great way to do things, but it's the best that we have now. Um, and and uh, it, it 
overall, it, it takes a, a really long time to get all of that done. Um, so if, if they could have a, a better, faster, easier, more reliable way to get this task done for themselves uh, and all of their partner institutions, that would be a phenomenal thing. Uh, next slide. So the Coral Tile is the solution to these problems. Um, the goal is to provide a platform that's tailor-made to solve this problem. Uh, it has to be a manufacturable device that other institutions can make use of as well. Um, this, this device, this single device, uh, takes the place of four separate sensing devices, uh, integrating them together, uh, recording all of that data automatically and making that available to researchers uh, when they surface or even weeks after the fact if they need to record that data later on. Uh, it also has to be affordable so that researchers across different institutions who are also participating in the project can have access to them and uh, make use of them. Uh, overall, per dive, per, per, per recording mission, uh, they need about up to, up to 14, at least six up to 14. So uh, if it was really expensive, it would be a really not a, not a great solution. So it, so it has to be affordable. And it also has to be simple on, and compact so that it's easy to use, so that um, it, it, it doesn't make the process even more complicated. Uh, and you can see that this, uh, this image, you know, it kind of looks like a, a digital alarm clock. Uh, it isn't, I promise. Um, it's it's uh, a really basic LCD screen, um, but that, that one right there is only the prototype. The, the final design would have much more, including a compass and um, temperature, all sorts of things. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so for this project, uh, everything has to be custom designed. Um, sorry if there's a, a lot of background noise right now. Um, everything has to be custom designed and uh, there's a lot of interesting work to be done on those projects. Um, from material science uh, considerations that have to, have to be thought about and uh, manufacturing, firmware, even web development. Um, because if, if, you, if you look on this on the top, top right, you'll actually see that, that microchip is a, uh, is a, a, a web, it, it's a, it's a Wi-Fi microchip. And uh, in order to be able to connect to these devices easily, um, the, the simplest solution we, given the harsh environment is actually um, to launch a, a Wi-Fi server and connect to it with any browser, like a phone or a laptop. Um, and and that, that presents another uh, engineering challenge uh, with, it, uh, with itself as well. Um, and so this, this system has to be thoroughly designed. Uh, it, or the way the system is being designed, the way the development process is working is that the uh, system is thoroughly designed before any soldering or programming is done so that not only we can get the most out of the system, um, but we can also avoid any surprises down the line like uh, I2C failures or, or bricking devices for some reason um, or, or power irregularities of some kind, which can happen very easily. Uh, if you don't spend the time to, to make it get it right. Um, and this, this device is also a, a very heavily integrated system. Uh, for example, a change in the form factor um, will uh, require a change in the PCB or, or requirements in el the electronics will dictate constraints in the manufacturing and vice versa. Um, overall, it's a, it's a challenging and complex system uh, that I, I really enjoy working on and uh, I think Anybody who wants to work on something to, to really sink their teeth into is going to enjoy that. Um, next slide. So there's a lot of challenges associated with just making a device like this. Um, here's, here's a few of them, but uh, I'll, I'll just touch upon maybe manufacturing a little bit. Um, the, the, the manufacturing of a device like this uh, it can't be too complex. If, if you want to make 500 or 1,000, then, uh, then uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it has to be designed very well to be able to be suitable to be manufactured. Um, and so there's, there's all these sorts of challenges. And if you uh, go ahead and uh, contact me later on, we can talk more about these. Um, next slide. Um, and so what we're looking for in this uh, project, uh, the kind of roles that we have available, um, 
there's there's I, I don't really particularly care if you're a mechanical engineering, uh, electronics, sociology. I don't really care if you can contribute to this project and you want to contribute to this project. Um, you can work on whatever, whichever one of these components. Um, and so for electronics, the, the most heavy things are power and circuits, but there's of course a lot more because this is such a complex system. Um, for software, it's mostly just firmware and web development. And for the mechanical components, um, there's a lot of materials considerations. Um, for example, the, the case material has to be um, thought about quite, quite, quite intensely because it's gonna be exposed to such harsh environments. Um, manufacturing, uh, for example, we might have to implement an injection molding process to, to make this uh, product mass producible in, in, in small quantities. Um, and there's, there's a whole bunch more um, mechanical considerations that go into it as well. And, and there you, in, that, in that image, you can kind of get a sense of how there's, there's actually a lot going on. Even though it, it's, it looks simple, it's actually a very complex uh, piece of machinery that really, really draws on all uh, all of these disciplines. Uh, next slide. Uh, so yeah, um, if, if something I said uh, piqued your interest or if you just wanna learn more about the project, uh, go ahead and shoot me an email and we can have a conversation and see if the project is right for you. Thank you. Cool, so next up is the uh, Acoustic Species team uh, led by Jacob Ayers. All right, everyone little background on myself. I'm a second year transfer and an electrical engineering major. So the automated acoustic species identification project is the result of a collaboration between engineers for exploration and population sustainability researchers from the San Diego Zoo World Wildlife Alliance. So we go ahead into the next slide. Uh, this project came to be uh, after the San Diego Zoo researchers went out and deployed what's known as an acoustic array in the Peruvian Amazon. And this acoustic array consisted of 35 microcontroller-like devices that I can show off one here. It's similar to a Raspberry Pi or kind of like an Arduino. And um, what they're doing, trying to do is break into something known as the passive acoustic monitoring field where they deploy these low cost audio recorders for months at a time. In this case, I believe two months over the summer of 2019. And uh, they just collect a massive amount of data. And now it is our job to be sort of the tip of the spear in parsing through and extracting useful information from that data. So if we go into the next slide. Um, the sort of information we're focused on is information that helps these population sustainability researchers generate population density estimates of different wildlife from their calls. Now, historically, um, or not necessarily historically, more recently, they these people have focused on using camera traps and using machine learning to uh, classify camera trap images. And then, you know, they've, in, in the deployment region where these audio models were deployed, they have a paper about tracking Jaguar estimates. And now what they're trying to do is kind of translate their work in the image classification domain into the audio classification domain, because it opens up a lot of different doors for better and for worse. Um, you know, a lot of different species that would be very hard to take images of and hard to get population density estimates of, specifically like smaller species like crickets and birds. Um, are, are very noisy. And so we can try to gauge how well their populations are doing. Um, and there is a very large abundance of data in audio, which is good and bad because it's, you know, more data means more separating data from other data. Um, and it's also challenging to label because not everybody can, it's, it's harder to label audio than to label images. So if we go on to the next slide, um, this, you know, machine learning and the passive acoustic monitoring domain, passive acoustic monitoring domain is, are both, you know, very large fields. And so what we're focused on right now is uh, trying to separate um, bird vocalizations or just vocalizations of specific species of interest from audio clips. And so we commonly refer to this as a weak label versus a strong label problem. So you can have a minute long clip that says, Yes, there is a bird somewhere in here, 
But the next level is to say, OK, we have a minute long clip. Where are the 15 seconds where the actual vocalizations occur? And so we're currently working with different, uh, with, or sorry, one neural network that outputs what are known as what we refer to as a local score array, which you can kind of see is these little blue peaks on this uh, top graph here. And what we're trying to do is develop automated techniques that kind of look at those moment to moment labels and try to extract the um, vocalizations out of the audio clip using this local score array. So if we go into the next slide, this is kind of an overview of our current workflow um, to get these uh, automated labels. So in order to you know, get automated labels, well, we first need some human labels. So I currently have a team that is dedicated to building an audio labeling system. And what we're going to be doing is acquiring a bunch of strong human labels from audio data that has already labeled um, for bird presence. And then we have uh, a bunch of different automated labeling techniques that we kind of refer to as isolation techniques that go through these local score arrays and try to extract out bird vocalizations. Um, and so the last three kind of uh, topics here, uh, those are being completed using a Python package that we're developing. And so this Python package has all these isolation techniques, and it also has a bunch of different uh, statistical metrics that we use to compare the automated labels uh, to the uh, human labels. Uh, Gady, do you have a question? Hi. Yeah, it's Gadi. Um, so I was wondering, um, what kind of uh, what kind of work can we expect to be doing on the project, and how multidisciplinary is it? Uh, I'll, I'll I'll have a slide later on that has like uh, the skills we're looking for and whatnot. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And so we. Um, so we're going to try to kind of combine these statistical metrics with the automated labeling techniques to perform kind of gradient descent and try to figure out, OK, how can we optimize these isolation techniques? So if we go to the next slide, there is another, um, I have another image that is sort of a pictorial representation of this workflow. Uh, Nathan, can you go to the next slide? So, you know, we pass in these audio clips into a bird present uh, recurrent neural network. We get these local score arrays. We pass them into the automated labeling system. We get some annotations. And then we also pass those same audio clips into a human labeling system. And then we compare and we use those metrics to try to auto optimize the automated labeling techniques. So uh, going to the next slide. So another kind of general problem that we're facing that is common in the passive acoustic monitoring domain is that there are um, there's a large amount of uh, internet data sets, specifically when it, as it relates to bird calls. And that's why our work is heavily skewed towards bird calls. It's due to the abundance of internet uh, crowdsourced bird audio. Um, these internet data sets perform much better across most uh, frameworks. And so if you're not familiar with ROC curves, I think the main thing you need to have your eyes drawn to is like the, in the first image on the far left, like the 0 0.81, 0 0.88, 0 0.74. You can kind of see that these two ROC curves on the left are on internet data sets that we scraped. And then the ROC curve on the right is a um, is from field data that I manually, manually labeled. And so we're trying to kind of bridge this uh, gap. And we have a couple different techniques. Um, that we're, you know, we have yet to really deploy, but something you all can help us out with. So if we go on to head into the next slide, um, these are the sort of skills we're working, for, looking for. So as I alluded to, we have a, a web app that we have developed to bring in volunteers and go through and label audio. And um, the web app is almost completed, but we need some people with experience in uh, like DevOps. AWS and whatnot. Uh, the front end's currently written in React. The back end's in Python Flask. Um, we already have, it's already a multi-container Docker environment. And so we just need to have someone that is competent in once we get like an Ubuntu instance, they can deploy the web app and we can start getting uh, users and whatnot. Uh, furthermore, I mentioned in the machine learning domain, we're a little pigeonholed right now because we're only using one framework. So we'd love to, um, if you only have soft machine learning skills, but some 
competency in Python, you can try to flesh out the RNN framework we currently have a bit more, and we have plenty of avenues to do that. But if you feel like you're an intermediate level of expertise in machine learning, and you're like, hey, I'm familiar with this framework, I want to try it in bird audio classification. Um, if you can get me uh, a local score array that I can uh, pass into my Python package, I'd be very happy. Uh, and so I list off some uh, Python packages that are commonly associated with uh, machine learning here. Um, furthermore, uh, any if someone has some decent skills in Python software development, uh, the Python package that we currently have kind of fits our needs for the most part, or it's getting there. And uh, but if it would be great to have someone kind of expand on it so that it could be you know more generalizable. Like currently, it only works with WAV files, so it'd be great if it you know handled MP3 files as well. Uh, we need more testing on different systems other than Linux systems. And so I listed some packages that are kind of what we're focused on. And then just general data science statistics knowledge is super handy because most of our meetings, um, I'm talking about statistics and whatnot. And you know, the one of our main collaborators, he is a um, you know, he is a quantitative ecologist, so he's a numbers guy. So, uh, you know, a lot of our conversations are skewed uh, towards that. Um, and so as our Python package is, you know, once we reach a stable state, we want to run lots of experiments. And so lots of statistics related conversations there. Um, so go on to the next slide. And so I listed some further uh, some further links that you guys can look at. And also, um, Sean Perry, the kind of he's leading the push in the uh, web app. He is running an ngrok instance right now. So uh, you can actually experiment with the web app that we have right now. But I'll ask that you guys don't go on the web app right now. Wait till the end of the presentation. And then if you're interested in this project, you can play around with it. Um, so if you can go ahead and put that link on the Zoom chat. And yeah. Um, yeah, and so if you want to reach out to me, there's my email. And that's about all I have to say. Oh, um, quick question. Right. Uh, well, Nathan, I think we should hold questions about specific projects till the end. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of, we're going to be here all night if we ask questions, so because there's a nine or nine or so more projects. Um, but um, if you want to type it in, or if you want to just reach out to Jacob um, directly, then we can do that. Yeah, I'll answer any questions in chat. Okay, moving on. So there's a mangrove team uh, led by Dylan Hicks. Uh, okay, hey everyone. Uh, I'm Dylan Hicks. I'm the technical lead of the mangrove monitoring project and engineers of exploration. Uh, I've been part of this project for around, I think, three or four years, so a while now. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll first start off with you know explaining uh, what our project is all about, and then after that, uh, kind of moving into specifically what we need for this quarter. Um, so next slide. Yeah, so just a background on mangroves. Mangroves are you know, a really special type of tree species and they live on the coast of tropical areas uh, really all over the world. So um, they oftentimes live in estuarial zones. So right in between uh, freshwater and saltwater and on, on the coast of these, these hot areas. Uh, next slide. And we really care about them because uh, the value that they have for you know, humanity as a whole. Um, so they're really good at carbon sequestration. It's actually taking out carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and storing them in their roots. So they're really good at fighting climate change. Um, and also you know, protection of tropical storms. They can essentially act as uh, a sponge against a lot of you know, storms such as hurricanes and typhoons, uh, protecting a lot of these tropical areas. Um, and also, you know, they, they are essentially the breadbasket for a lot of fisheries, um, really ensuring that a lot of fishermen in there can have, you know, their, their income. And because of all these reasons, they have a super high value, so $57,000 per hectare. Um, so a lot of countries have set up a lot of different uh, kind of goals to protect these mangroves. Uh, next slide. Um, so just a background on specifically what we do. So um, one of our collaborators has recently published a paper on actually um, correcting uh, classifications, worldwide classifications of mangroves. So where exactly these mangroves are. Um, and we actually go out to these areas and fly drones. Um, so our thought is with, with, with this publication was, uh, you know, we could use this drone, drone imagery and other high resolution imagery to actually correct uh, you know, this global mangrove data set. And we use this through kind of a, a, a convolution analysis. Uh, next slide. 
Um, so essentially we can you know, take satellite imagery and our drone imagery and kind of process this imagery and you know, of course correct it to get better and more accurate mangrove classifications across the entire world. Next slide. Um, so what we wanna do is we wanna use a tool called Google Earth Engine, which is kind of this, uh, this tool that, that Google released to do remote sensing analysis uh, kind of in the cloud. Um, so it's super easy to do. Um, so essentially what we want to do is hook up this remote sensing analysis that we've done previously to Google Earth Engine to make it easy for you know, more collaborators to actually do this correction. Because um, right now, um, it's kind of kind of tough to do, kind of hard to to get others on board to it. And, you know, a lot of remote sensing scientists and uh, biologists don't really know how to do this. So if we put this on Google Earth Engine, it'll be a lot easier for them to use. Um, so the skills we want for this in particular are JavaScript, um, since Google Earth, Earth Engine um, it's coded in, in in JavaScript, and also uh, an interest in remote sensing. And then next slide. And uh, like I said before, uh, mangroves are truly exceptional at capturing biomass uh, out, of, out of the air and storing in their roots. Um, so right now um, we have a lot done a lot of work to actually measure how much do these mangroves actually store. Um, so right now we have uh, actual scripts and work done to actually calculate that in the next slide. And what we want to do is kind of make something similar to our image classification tool. So right now we actually have tools that can classify our drone imagery and um, you know give classification. So this is super easy for scientists to just log into our website, upload their imagery, and get the classifications. Um, and then next slide. And we essentially want to do this with our biomass calculations. So you know make a web page that will you know enable users and you know, our collaborators to actually just plug in their images and get biomass measurements, actually you know, being able to give a lot of these countries the measurements they want to further conserve mangroves. So of course for this, you know, it's web development. We're gonna need uh, someone to um, you know, make this website and figure out how to interface it with the code that our group has already written. Um, and also you know, Python programming. A lot of what we've done is in Python. So um, interfacing with that, you kind of need the skills to do that. Um, next slide, I think this is the last one. So yeah, um, just as an overview, you know, uh, for the Google Earth Engine project, of course, um, JavaScript and interest in remote sensing will be preferable. And then for our biomass project, um, you know, kind of similar to another project that we've done previously. So um, web development and Python programming is, is nice. Um, and I wouldn't say that that all these skills are, you know, they're not absolutely required. Um, pretty much nine out of 10 times, I prefer someone who, you know, is really excited about the project and is hard worker rather than someone who matches the skills perfectly. Um, Cause most of the time that person's going to put in better work than the person who, you know, has those skills. So uh, if you guys are interested in, you know, these projects or anything else that we do, feel free to reach out to me in, on my email or if you're on our Slack, um, my name is just Dylan. So just shoot me a message. Okay, thank you. Cool. Next up is the Maya Archaeology Project, led by Giovanni. Hello. Um, so I work on Maya Archaeology. And what we do in this project is related to cultural heritage preservation. Um, there's supposed to be a, a, a GIF plane here, but I guess not. Um, so this is a visualization of uh, tunnel excavation in Guatemala in Unreal Engine. and. Uh, Mainly in this project, we look at ways to digitally document places and how do we visualize them and how do we share them? And there's a lot of different like combinations of all that. And um, so our collaborator is a Mayan, Mayan archeologist, Tom Garrison. And every summer he gets to go to Guatemala to do field work and uh, go to these excavations. And in the past we've had students uh, work on like constructing efficient aerial LIDAR uh, drones that can go and map out these regions um, that moved on to uh, going to these places and doing terrestrial LIDAR scans to obtain these uh, point clouds. And then going on, uh, it even turned into like, how do we capture these uh, locations in real time using like SLAM algorithms, different combinations of like cameras and sensors and these algorithms. And so with all that data, uh, we moved on to like reaching out to the VR club Triant XR, which is when I joined. And so I've been mainly looking into uh, how do you uh, digitally recreate uh, specific locations? Um, and so next slide. And so this is kind of like 
what goes on. Uh, this is a point cloud we took uh, uh, two summers ago and you get all these noisy trees coming in and then you want to be able to filter it. And there's different ways to do that. I've mainly kind of looked at like manual ways, but uh, I'm sure that uh, a combination of like machine learning and manual labor would be able to uh, segment segment these point clouds uh, uh, semantically. So there's opportunity there to kind of uh, dig more into like taking the first point cloud on the top and uh, being able to process it through with machine learning, et cetera, and uh, separating the trees from the, the terrain and other features. Um, next slide. And so this is like just a quick overview of the kind of work I've been doing in this project. And it's just kind of a general workflow if you want to uh, recreate uh, locations digitally. Um, and so that starts off by, you know, merging point clouds, cleaning them up, and uh, turning that into a mesh, which you then need to clean up and, uh, and next slide. And so even uh, looking back on this workflow, I made this about two years ago. And, uh, you know, I feel like uh, with the new Unreal Engine 5, you know, they kind of promise uh, not having to worry about like kind of traditional game dev things where you have to worry about the amount of triangles you have. And, and so this is still kind of a valuable workflow uh, to build like in a kind of quick manner to, to go through this whole workflow of texturing these environments with uh, accurate color and geometric data using LIDAR and photogrammetry. Next slide. And yeah, so this was gonna be uh, just uh, uh, kind of the end result of that. It's just a little visualization in Unreal Engine. Uh, next slide. And so that's more focused on us like a local region inside of an excavation, which is um, buried underneath the ground. And if you were to walk outside of the excavation, you would be uh, surrounded by all this for this jungle. And, um, and so I would want to be able to recreate that. How do you recreate like an accurate uh, geographic model? And you could do things like uh, query, like, you know, uh, available databases. Um, you can fly drones and create your own digital, digital elevation models. And, um, and you can uh, create these color maps to kind of procedurally generate these uh, landscapes with uh, accurate color data and populate the terrain and um, trees. Uh, next slide. And so this is uh, the same thing with that is now we have available uh, photogrammetry. There's a huge library of photogrammetry models uh, via Quixel mega scans and Unreal Engine uh, that are relevant to this project. And so I can see, foresee like, you know, populating this terrain with, with these kind of models. Next slide. And so that was kind of uh, in the past, but recently um, there's starting to be more geospatial tools integrated into game engines like Unreal and Unity. And that's really interesting. You can actually zoom out all the way to, to space and look at the earth as a little globe and just fly, zoom in all the way to the ground of this tunnel or anywhere else. And so I just kind of put these screenshots to kind of, of different uh, altitudes. Uh, and this is just like, um, this is a mesh of the actual excavation this is kind of like what it looks like outside topology. Um, and this is that place that uh, it's just general coordinate um, in El Zotes, Guatemala. And so um, there's new features coming out in this where you can like call away uh, the landscape and replace it with your own. And it's just very interesting what's going on here. Uh, next slide. And so like the end result is how do you distribute this? And there's uh, different ways to visualize this. You can have this kiosk or VR or any these XR glasses coming out. It's kind of trying to accommodate all these different mediums, whether you're using a 2D screen or not. Next slide. And so this project's a little bit different and it's kind of like building a, a video game. I've drafted like a design document uh, to build like kind of fully fledged uh, uh, digital twin of, of the archeological site. Um, and so a lot of those kind of skills and methods are, are listed here. And so yeah, reach out to me if you're if you're interested. Um, thank you. Cool. So the next project is the Baboon project, uh, led by Chris. Uh, thanks, Nathan. Next slide. So I'm gonna start this with with the video, be just because I feel like that's kind of the easiest way to kind of give perspective. 
So we're not going to watch the entirety of this video, but maybe like the first minute and I'll like... On the picturesque Lakipia Plateau of Kenya, Dr. Shirley Strum has been studying several troops of baboons for nearly five decades. One of her aims is to better understand their collective decision making. With troop sizes varying between 20 to 150 individuals, it can be difficult to keep track of both group level and individual movement trajectories, particularly since the baboons prefer rough terrain and large boulders as sleeping sites. To improve her logistical ability to attract multiple animals, she reached out to the team at Engineers for Exploration, where we set to work using drone footage to get a bird's eye view of the entire troop, unlocking information about baboon behavior that has not previously been available. So, um, so I, I'd like to start with that video just because it's kind of hard to tell perspective. So we're we're the baboons on we're, we're the baboons on the move uh, group, and what we're looking for, what we're trying to do is we're trying to track these individual baboons from a drone that flies about eighty meters above the ground. And kind of the difficulty with that is that um, that and that. Uh, the, the animals are not very large, you know, roughly 40 inches tall, give or take. So Nathan, if you go back to that video, just near the, near, I think like the 50 second mark, um, I, just, just to get like a, I'm sorry, I, that's way too, too between far. The it's probably actually more the 30 second. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Um, so we, you can see from, from this video that, and this is actually a cropped video, that, it, that they're not particularly large. So kind of what our main focus is on how can we track these individual animals from footage that looks like this. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'm not gonna get, so we've worked just to kind of, uh, before we get into that, to kind of toot our own horn a bit and to kind of, uh, just because I want to applaud the, the rest of my teammates, we do have one publication on our belt. We're working on more. I'm not going to speak too much to this. Uh, next slide. Um, so, so to kind of talk about how we, what we do now and what our, and where we want to be, um, the, the general idea is that we use some, some motion tracking. To try to, to try to determine uh, which pixels are candidate baboon pixels. After we do that, we've got a couple of different paths that we're trying. So we want to determine, so kind of our goals for the upcoming quarter is that we want to be able to determine, um, given, given the footage that, that, that I showed you, it, how separable is the data? Can, can you differentiate the baboons from, from the background features? And in some cases, the answer to that is absolutely yes. But in some cases, uh, there's a suspicion that the answer to that is no. So this, this is going to be looking at statistics. This is going to be looking at, um, at, at some understanding of deep learning. So if you are interested in using learning for kind of complex uh, ident classification on rather uh, noisy footage that this might be something that interests you. Um, and kind of continue on the discussion about noise. Is there ways that we can reduce the noise in this footage? There are some techniques that OpenCV uses and then there are, um, we want to explore those and or possibly explore some other statistical methods. So once again, we're looking for someone who's somewhat familiar with statistics. Um, We've been working on trying to make sure that we have the right parameters selected. This is something that's low on our list, but as we continue to add filters and change our algorithm, we're going to want to continue trying to keep our parameters accurate. Um, and, and we're also still we're also talking about doing some more statistics with uh, Bayesian and Kalman filtering. So. These basically are how do you how do you take noisy data and get relevant information out of it? Um, any questions about that? I think we'll okay. leave those to the end, Chris. Yeah, just so we can keep keep chugging along. Okay. Next, uh, next slide then. So, uh, kind of our recommended project skills is we're looking for 
for someone who's familiar with Python, computer vision, statistics, and has some background in deep learning. Again, if you don't have these things but are interested in uh, vision projects, interested in baboons, if you're motivated, these are definitely things that you can learn. Uh, next slide. Cool. So the next project is the IS Sleep Monitoring Project, uh, which will be uh, discussed by Katie and Amaya. All right. So I'll start. Um, Amaya, and um, I'm one of the people working on this project along with Katie and Jamia. Um, next slide, Nathan. So IIs are basically a species of lemur, which are currently classified as endangered. And they are specifically found mostly in uh, Madagascar and the neighboring regions. They're also the world's largest nocturnal primate. Um, and mostly the conservation efforts towards IIs are speeding up now because one of the sister species of the IIs have already gone extinct. So um, efforts towards their conservation are um, taken into account and more are now. Um, next slide, Nathan. Um, so just to give a brief project overview. So this project um, is again in uh, collaboration with the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. Um, and we are working with the conservation team. So the goal of this project is basically, as you see the uh, enclosures in which the IIR are kept. And what we wanna do is through a sensor network, um, we have cameras, audio sensor data, and inertia sensors. What we want to do is basically generate a stream of data, um, which gives us zeros and ones and non-existent values. So zeros if the IIRs are not sleeping well, and ones if they are sleeping at peace. And uh, non-existence if they're awake or are not present in the enclosure. Um, so the sensor network that we are establishing consists of various Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, other sensors. And then we stream all this data to a data server and then analyze it. Um, next slide, Nathan. So as I said earlier, the, specific, the specifications of the network are, so the hardware we're using uh, mostly IR and IP cameras inertial sensors and uh, microphones along with Arduino microphones to gather audio data. The most uh, viable software component right now we're looking at is computer vision, obviously. And along with that, um, vibration and audio analysis through our microphones and couple that with machine and deep learning, uh, we'll hope to get the binary stream of data in the future. So currently we are working on um, the hardware aspect. Um, we are also the software integrating the hardware. So we have got TCP running and all of our tests um, to check whether our sensor network actually works. Um, and we've got tests running around that um, in the couple of weeks. Um, and the software project hopefully is deployed through the next two years. Um, that's it for me. I'll hand it to Katie for the rest of the presentation. Okay, hi. <laughs> so this is a diagram of the system specifications. It's just meant to give you all a sense of the flow of the data and like where all the components come together. So I work on the Arduino Nano and the IP camera while Amaya works on the data server and the on-box sensor unit. So together, as Amaya mentioned, we collect data from our different peripherals and then all the data is stored on the data server. So we can go to the next slide, Nathan. Uh, so on the right is actually like a picture of one of the IP cameras I work on. And then on the left is like a CAD design of one of the boxes with like Raspberry Pi and other components. So for our goals for this quarter leading us into the summer, we want to complete a full cycle testing the sensor network, making sure that the system runs smoothly for a long duration. And then after that, we'll have to start analyzing the data and the audio. So we can go to the next slide. So, First, we're looking for skills for the data analysis, as Amaya mentioned, so like machine learning and being able to use like the sensor data from the Arduino Nano and the different audio data so that we can then uh, figure out how to like define the states of sleep, whether the IIs are awake or asleep and basing that, back, basing that on the data that we have in the videos. And then the next skill set we'll need is data management, just making sure that the data server is working and that um, the files are organized and things like that. So if you have any, this is our last slide, but if you have any questions, you can message me or Maya or Nathan on Slack or email us as well. So that's all from us. Thank you. 
Cool. So our next project is the Fish Sense project uh, led by Peter. All right. All right. Um, yeah, so we are uh, Fish Sense is the project that I lead. It is, I think, the um, newest project. We're less than a year at this point, uh, but we've had pretty explosive growth. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. Um, let's uh, go two slides forward. Um, let's skip. I have a video here, which I think is going to autoplay if you hit. Yeah, so let's go. Let's skip that. Um, if that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, um, just in the interest of time, I'll just give a, um, a high level overview of what we're trying to do. Um, what we, we were approached by a professor at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography um, who was interested in uh, collecting data about fish in a better um, non-invasive, more accurate way. Um, so you, you can um, uh, see there in the upper right hand corner, this is um, a member of the California Coastal Fisheries um, Institute. Um, collecting uh, imagery of fish um, using a stereo camera system, which is relatively large, um, can be kind of unwieldy for divers to handle. Um, and when you bring the data back to the surface and go through it, uh, you get inaccuracies. Um, having it, you, it, it's kind of hard to actually determine the length of the fish, um, and it's really hard to determine the volume of the fish um, when trying to reconstruct between these two different camera feeds. Uh, and so he approached us and was like, hey, what if we had a lower profile, um, more accurate um, direct depth imaging device that we used underwater? Um, and so we um, bought some of these cameras, these Intel RealSense 3D cameras, which use infrared imaging um, to combine um, together depth information from the scene that they see, uh, kind of like uh, Xbox Connect in that way. Um, and uh, combines it with an RGB camera they have inside the device to get a full 3D picture um, with color of uh, whatever it sees. Uh, when we first got this, we didn't know how it was going to work at all. We know infrared um, isn't the greatest underwater. We thought we might only get um, you know, 20 to 30 centimeters at a time and this project would be just dead in the water. But when we actually put it all together and stuck it in, we were getting five, six and more uh, meters. Uh, which is um, perfect for these sort of applications. Um, and so we've been developing this handheld system. You can see on the bottom right there, um, that is the tube with the camera in the front there. Um, it's missing the actual handheld part of it. There are um, actual plastic uh, grips um, that are attached to the side of it. Um, but uh, that is the system that we are uh, developing currently. And then on top of that, um, we are employing um, uh, machine learning uh, to take in the images from this camera, take in the 3D images um, and automatically detect the fish uh, and detect where the fish are in these images and um, measure them to get length information um, directly from these images. Um, one day, uh, get hopefully soon get volume information um, from them. Um, that's going to depend on us being able to clean up and filter these images um, appropriately. Um, and then past that, getting species information and then even farther past that, um, being able to identify individual fish um, based on uh, patterns, which is an active research uh, area in Scripps. Um, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, for our goals for um, upcoming summer, yeah, you can go ahead and click on that video. Um, this will just, um, this shows a uh, deployment um, when we were in the Birch Aquarium here in Scripps, um, we had a diver bring down the camera and sort of uh, go around with it. So you can see the RGB image on the bottom right and the depth image on the bottom on the bottom left. So you can see we get um, decent quality data. There's um, certainly noise, um, especially when things come into the foreground. Um, but overall, we're very pleased with the results and are excited to make them even better. Um, so our goals for the spring are to get a fully operational handheld system, um, get it sealed um, and ready to deploy um, at any given um, time. We have a tank that we use to, um, it doesn't have fish in it, but we can put a fake fish in it. Um, so we want to be able to get a lot of data that way. Want to be able to go back to the Birch Aquarium, um, go to other tanks in the area um, or deploy um, off the coast in La Jolla Cove or something like that, which we've tried to do in the past. Um, that's on the uh, mechanical and electrical and firmware side. On the software side, we want to be able to automate this length volume measurement process. Um, at the moment, we are just doing things manually. Um, that we are training detectors and um, to, to, to do that um, to do that better. Um, there's going to become issues of calibration, filtering out noise, um, just kind of the edge cases. Um, because eventually what we want to be able to do is to scale the system um, so we can 
um, create and deploy hundreds of these in um, the hands of citizen science divers. Um, but we can only do that if we're confident that our post-processing um, will work effectively. Um, sort of a tangential point to that, um, we're looking not just at a handheld system, but also at a camera trap system. We add more batteries, we make it a little bit larger, and we have it uh, gather data a little uh, more slowly. It'll just sit on the seafloor for weeks at a time. Um, that is something that we've been in discussion with um, other professors, and it'll still, it'll still use the same core technology. Um, but that's a, a task that we can um, um, accelerate, especially if people are interested in doing that. And then finally, this is a very you know, stretch goal, um, but something that may be interesting to people. Um, there's a specific type of camera in the RealSense product line, um, which we originally tried to use for this project, um, but ended up not working because um, it was very difficult to waterproof. And that's the um, RealSense uh, L515, which is a LiDAR-based system, still in the infrared spectrum. Um, but the one we're using currently uses an infrared bulb and a stereo pair. This would actually directly measure um, distance uh, via LIDAR. Um, so figuring out a way to effectively waterproof it, the issue primarily is getting the right um, air water interface um, between the camera. Um, something because this LIDAR is very, very bright. If you have something that's too reflective, it's just going to shine everything right back at you and you won't be able to see anything. Um, but if we are able to get that working, um, there's a lot of potential value that unlocks um, not just for measuring fish, but also for um, reconstructing seafloors, uh, coral reefs, and the like. Um, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so skills needed, since we're kind of um, across the entire stack, um, there's a lot of skills that are, that are useful to us. Um, as far as firmware and embedded programming, C++ is our bread and butter. Um, training detectors and classifiers, um, familiar, familiarity with Python is a, is a must, of course, that's um, pretty typical. Um, and then also um, being familiar with image processing and OpenCV, um, being able to count, recalibrate these images, to, to rectify them, um, to denoise them, um, is uh, going to be something we're going to be focusing a lot on over the next six months. Um, and then past that, um, we're also starting to look into uh, graphical user interface development, uh, especially as we become more um, customer facing rather than um, just uh, insular within the lab. Um, you know, we want to get this in the hands of people who are not engineers, who are, who are divers. Um, and then also just general system architecture design and analysis. Um, there's a lot of moving parts in these um, systems, a lot of things that change, a lot of things that can be improved. And so having a, a knack for um, keeping all of that straight and understanding it um, is, is really valuable. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll leave it off. Um, the next slide. Cool. So the next project is the radio telemetry tracking project uh, led by Mia. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Mia. I'm the current project lead of the radio telemetry tracking project. Um, a little bit of background on me. I'm a fourth year computer engineering undergrad and um, I've been on this project for about a year now. Uh, next slide. So um, quick overview of the main goal and like motivations for this project. Um, this project was made in collaboration with the San Diego Zoo's Institute for Conservation Research. And the overall goal of the project is to create a drone-based system for tracking animals with radio telemetry. Um, so traditional methods of tracking animals um, usually involve using a like radio antenna, using it to determine what direction the transmitter is in and then moving towards that direction, um, typically on foot. Uh, which is a process that can be incredibly taxing on um, uneven terrain, both in terms of uh, time and physical effort. So, um, which is why our solution was to create a drone-based system to make the process more efficient. Um, there are several components to this project, but currently we are going to be focusing on, the, um, on developing the UI board firmware, um, the task manager, and the optimization of the um, estimate precision calculations. Um, I'll talk more about these later. Uh, next slide. So um, overview of how the system currently works is that um, the drone will fly over a specified area that the animal is suspected to be in. And um, then as it flies over this area, um, it uses the strength of pings received along the drone's flight path to calculate where the transmitter is in real time. Um, so this image on the right here is um, what is a screenshot of what our UI looks like post-flight. Um, each of those colored dots represents a ping received 
And that um, blue diamond in the center represents the final location estimate that um, is produced. So um, using the system of collecting and calculating the location of the transmitter in flight, um, we're able to find a pretty accurate estimate of where the animal is. Um, next slide. So here's an overview of the main components going into the system. Um, so far, the uh, live data visualizations have been implemented. However, um, calculations that produce the um, precision of our estimate are um, they are very time consuming as more data is collected and must be taken into account. So um, currently one of our main goals is to um, optimize these calculations um, as well as uh, completing the uh, boxes you see in red, which are the, we're going to be focusing on completing the system manager, um, the UI board and the payload compass uh, going forward into spring and summer. Uh, next slide. So um, here are the main focuses that I talked about for the upcoming quarter. Um, I'll explain a bit about what these components do. So the UI board is responsible for um, communication with the onboard computer and it um, sets LEDs that tell us uh, status of the system as well as handles communication with the GPS and compass. Um, the task manager is responsible for starting up and configuring application software as well as completing checks on various system components before flight um, and facilitates uh, communication between the ground control system and the onboard computer. Um, and our final main focus for the upcoming quarters is um, on optimization of our more time consuming calculations, specifically the um, estimate precision calculation. Um, next slide. So uh, recommended skills for anyone interested in this project. Um, if you're interested in working on firmware, um, our modules and most code for the UI board is written in C. So being comfortable with that language is recommended. Or um, additionally, our system manager and our um, code for our calculations are both written in Python. Um, and for if you want to work with the math familiarity with um, some probability theory would is recommended to understand um, the math behind what we are doing. So uh, yeah. Cool, thank you. So the next project is the Burring Owl project. This is led by Justin. Yeah, what's up everybody? Uh, I'm Justin, I'm the project lead for this project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just a little motivation on what's going on with this project. Uh, so lately, the burying owl population has been seeing a decline, so researchers have been trying to gather data and find any useful information to help that decline. But um, the way they do that is they use camera trap imagery, which requires them to really go through a bunch of images, which is really taxing on them. So uh, they have partnered with us to, so that we can help them create an automated system um, that can go through their imagery and classify them. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, I'll show you guys a quick little thing what we have so far. Um, so right now we've really just created a foundation of this automated system. Um, and what it really does is just um, take it, camera trap imagery and just see if there's an owl or not in it. And that really deduces a lot of the bad images that are in uh, the data set they, they contain because um, these camera traps on, uh, activate on motion. So a lot of those images are nothing or just a stick in them. So that's not really useful. So we want to really just sift out those images and get through it. So our pipeline right now is we take a um, already created detector called mega detector. And all it really does is detect that there's an animal in the image. But obviously, we want to see if those animals are owl or not. So what we do is we detect it, crop it down, um, it classify those individual boxes, and then later analyze what is in them, so owl or non-owl. And that's basically the basis of our pipeline right now. So if we move on to the next slide, um, so for the goals of this spring, uh, we really want to just really finish this up um, and really verify and package this pipeline. And right now, uh, for the past like two quarters, we've been trying to make our binary part of the pipeline more robust because Recently, we got some new data that totally broke it. So yeah, 
uh, we wanted to fix that. And lately last quarter, we were able to. So now we just want to verify that and really make sure that it works on all kinds of data. And another thing we're trying to work on to really package this pipeline is to see if there's any more efficient or necessary modifications that we can put on this pipeline and that will help it make go faster or whatever. But um, yeah. And last thing, uh, really try to see if we can expand on the non-owl classification because right now, um, though we have the detector, sometimes it detects sticks. So um, we want to see if like those non-owl classifications are all like just animals, other animals, or just sticks. So if we can see if we can classify that further, would be nice. And uh, next slide. So in terms of like skills that we need, obviously machine learning would be pretty nice and some Python experience because most, not even most, all of our <laughs> coding is in Python. So yeah, th these two are really nice, but the overall thing that we're looking for is dedication, passion. So I came into this project not knowing nothing about machine learning and very little on Python, but here I am standing in front of you guys talking. So that's great. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so just some dedication and passion would be amazing for this team. Um, and yeah, if you want to contact me, um, that's my email and find me on Slack as well. Um, sorry, I made that really quick, but yeah, thank you. Cool. So our final project is a smartphone project led by Ben and Brooke. Great. Um, hi, everyone. I am Ben. I'm the co-lead on the project with Brooke, who could not uh, make it here today. Uh, next slide, Nathan. Thank you. Um, cool. We can actually go to the next one. All right. So um, essentially, SmartFin on is, the coast of the screen. Uh, yeah. So SmartFin is oh, keeps playing. Uh, Nathan, I'm not getting any sound on the video. Who he covers. All the parameters are the same. Imagine if in addition to this single buoy, each of these surfers below could become virtual buoys, recording important information about ocean health. Enter the smart fin, a surfboard fin with a range of sensors that allow it to measure sea surface temperature, location, and other critical wave statistics. After the launch of the first generation smart fin in 2017, we have collected thousands of data points across the world from hundreds of surf sessions. This project uses extraordinary individuals known as surfers to not only conduct research about the changing oceans, but also to tell a story through science. SmartFin combines the immense grassroots power of the people with the unstoppable force of the scientific process, taking a step in the right direction towards healing our planet. Cool. So uh, basically what I was saying in that video is uh, SmartFin is a project <laughs> where we're putting um, sensors into surfboard fins so that we can gather data about the near shore zone just by having surfers go out and have fun. Um, so uh, next slide. So basically uh, our plan moving forward is that we want to manufacture new smart fins um, so that we can just have a new generation of fins for people to use. Um, and we also just want to spend a lot of time testing the accuracy of the fins um, and also the reliability, just so that we know that we have a good product that works over and over again. Um, and with that, we have a lot of data. So um, we're looking at comparing the smart fin to a pressure sensor on the Scripps Pier so that we can make sure that wave height calculations from the fin are working properly. Um, we're also building um, a double integral analysis and a spectral analysis, which will tell us um, a lot of information about wave heights and also wave energy and other important statistics, um, peak period and all of that. Uh, and then we're also building out a website that will showcase all of this data um, with location. So uh, if you're interested in any of those things, um, next slide. Then yeah, so we basically want people interested in manufacturing, data science, and web design. So um, for the first soldering experience or circuit assembly would be a good skill to have. Um, and pretty much all of our code is in Python um, for the data science aspect. 
So that would be really helpful to have background knowledge on that. Um, and we're also interested in people who uh, just sort of have a passion for data visualization. Um, and also, you know, we are working with surfboards and everything. So just people who are passionate about the ocean and the environment um, and also science communication would be really valuable. And I think that is all that we have. Yeah, so there's more info and a longer video on this slide as well, if you want to check it out. Cool, so thank you all for uh, sitting through and listening to all of our project leads tell us a little bit about their projects. So if you're interested, uh, Ryan already put this into the chat, but you can fill out the intake form at uh, either of those links. And basically what will happen is, is once you submit that application, uh, project leads will go and review those applications and if uh, if we're in and we'll uh, select basically kind of set people to interview um, once we once we conduct the interview then we'll you'll uh, we'll let you know within a week or so uh, kind of what you know how we can move forward um, and what this process basically is kind of looking at how well do you mesh with that team it's not really a look necessarily a focus on uh, you know, what you know, more of, you know, can you contribute, can, can you fit in well with that team and, and, and work okay. So that's kind of what that process is. Um, if you have any questions about any of these, uh, of course, these are also all on, on the previous slides, as well as on the website, uh, all the uh, emails for all of the, almost all the project leads. Um, and then if you want to ask any questions uh, to uh, about in E4E as a, high, a larger organization, uh, these are emails for the PIs and myself. So if you've got uh, more organizational scope questions, you can ask them there. Um, and then Kurt, do you want to say anything to close? Yeah, sure. sure. Uh, oh, I'm getting echo here. Are you getting that too? Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you to all the presenters uh, for, for taking the time and, and basically being so enthusiastic in, in kind of uh, talking about your projects and thank you all for, for attending. Um, you've heard a few times that really what we're looking for is people who are enthusiastic about this, right? And that's really key to this, to this program. It's really how much do you want to learn um, and, and hopefully you have a, a passion for, for engineering, for computer science, and for working on projects that, that make a difference, right? So this is a, a real good, good opportunity to apply things that you're learning in your classes or maybe are going to learn in your classes. So we don't expect you to already uh, be experts in all of this. So if you haven't taken a machine learning class yet, but you're interested in that field, um, you can actually already apply for engineering for exploration. Right. So, you, so you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to have taken the related classes. Uh, typically, actually, if you wait until you feel you have all the knowledge, it's kind of too late, right? Then you're in your, in your senior year, you're about to graduate, and you really wish you had done this sooner. So um, if, you're, if you are in your senior year, it's not too late. Um, you, can, you can still contribute. But even for those of you who are freshmen, sophomore, um, don't feel like you have to wait. So what's really important is that you are willing to pick up some of these skills um, along the way. And a lot of the project leads that, that talked to you today, they really didn't know what they were doing when they started either, right? So, so you're, not, you're not gonna be alone. Everyone kind of goes through this. Um, and it's, it's actually a great experience. The more time you put in, the more you're gonna get out of this. If uh, really, what we're looking for, we're hoping to find is, is students who really have a passion for this, who start out learning a lot and then continue working in E4E. And then you get, you get to go on these expeditions. You get to work with the scientists. Um, you, you really get to own these projects, right? You can become project leads. That there's really a lot of opportunity to grow here um, and, and make a difference. So hopefully you're enthusiastic about this. And, and hopefully this, this sounds, this sounds kind of cool. Um, I know there's already some of you here who, um, 
who are already involved in um, and so please keep involved uh, for those of you who for whom this this may be interesting just fill out fill out the links uh, fill out that form right and we hope that you'll you'll join us there's a lot of projects right um, hopefully you realize we need a lot of help we can definitely use you um, and and yeah, if, if this was maybe a little overwhelming, um, all this information is also available on the website and we'll, we'll post links to this recording as well and, and to all the information so you can kind of take a look at it um, again and kind of figure out what maybe you're most interested in. And even if you can't figure that out, just fill out the intake form and, and we'll kind of see if we can find a good match for you, for your interest, for your skills, and just for kind of what you want to get out of this program, right? But in general, the more you put in, the more you're going to get out. Um, that's that's just true for almost anything you do, and especially here when it's made for exploration. Um, so, yeah, Nathan, is there anything else? Um, no, at this point, I think what we're going to do is I will stay, keep meeting open if anyone wants to ask specific questions. I'll invite any of the project leads and PIs to stay on as well to help answer questions. But um, if you guys are uh, aside from that, you know, we're done and yeah, we'll hope to see you around. So if you have, if you, the deadline to fill out the intake form for this quarter will be next Friday, April 9th at around 6 p.m., 5, 6 p.m. So please get those in before then. But yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat, ask them out loud. If not, um, we'll see you around. Yeah, feel free to ask any questions if people are waiting around. Hi, um, I have a question um, maybe for SmartFin team. Um, so I know you guys have, we well, talked about how you have a, had a first generation of uh, Finn, you're working on your second generation. Finn, is there any, like, like uh, um, just out of curiosity, curious, what kind what of things are you measuring and what kind of things are you, like what, like, what sensors are you, are you thinking of adding, adding to the Finn? Uh, it looks like Ben actually left, but I can answer that. Um, so fins are designed as, as basically a sensor platform for the near shore environment. So there, what we're focusing on right now is wave height measurement. So primarily what we want to look at is as the surface just kind of floating up on the surf zone, how, what the wave height is, you know, wave period, um, all that. Um, and then Ideally, you know, one stretch goal would be to actually try and evaluate that information as we're actually surfing. Some of the other things that we're looking at are uh, salinity and temperature as we're, uh, you know, surfing. Uh, so you, there's actually a temperature sensor and a, a, a salinity cell in the spin itself, so that can get measured there. And then there's some uh, there's some ancillary uh, efforts to put. So stuff like uh, pH sensors or chlorophyll sensors into the smartphone package. And so those could be measured in the near shore environment as well. Okay, cool. Right, Thank, cool. You. Thank you. Nathan, are you able to answer this question that was in chat? related to someone who might be interested in working over the summer? Um, I would say fill out the intake form and then you just mentioned that you're primarily interested in working on this over the summer and then we can continue that discussion. Um, Kurt, Ryan, I believe most of the, the intent is for summer students to be from RU and SRIP, but I don't see a reason that other students couldn't 
Yeah, we would, we would need to look at this on like a, a case by case basis. Um, so just fill out fill out the intake form and, and mention this, and then then we can just uh, we can talk about it. But I think typically, if you want to be involved in summer, you would have to be involved before that as well. Nathan, you're giving some really nice feedback. This usually doesn't happen. I don't know what's wrong with my setup today. It's only on when anybody else is talking. So I feel like you have two microphones on. Go ahead, Ronan. Uh, you for being polite and raising your hand. So. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I guess one of my questions is um, for those coming in as um, a part of RU, what should we expect for next steps if we want to get started um, in the spring cycle? Um, well, you should probably kind of talk to us, um, me and Kurt mm -hmm. and Nathan, about what, what interests you. Um, and, and the involvement level involvement that you, you would want to have. Um, but certainly, you know, you, you've already been vetted in some sense, so you don't need to go through this application process. You've already done that. Um, so you can, I think would just a good uh, plan of attack would be just to uh, reach out to any of the project leads that you thought were interesting um, and see when they're having their, their, their weekly meetings and, um, and ask them just generally, you know, how do I, I best get involved? I think that would be the probably make the most sense at this point. But yeah, you don't need to worry about applying for, for, that, for that stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I definitely, great, well, that's perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and it's, it's really up to you what kind of involvement level you want to have before the RU starts. So we're, not, we're definitely not forcing you, but uh, there's definitely a lot of opportunity for you to get involved sooner, whenever, whenever mm -hmm. you want. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's great. Great to hear. Um, I'm really like, uh, I'm definitely looking forward to it. So, yeah. Thank you. I think we only have project leads left, or mostly. Are there anybody else that has any other questions for us? Thanks, leads, for, for doing this, by the way. Good job. We need to keep track a little bit of time next time. Uh, that's, that's just so many projects now, which we've never had had this. Uh, it's well, a good problem to have too many projects, I think, too many projects that are going well. So. Yeah, uh, our presentations were excellent. And actually, I think yeah. Nathan scheduled an hour and 20 minutes, right? Yeah, I was planning for an hour and a half. Um, so okay. so I, think, I think we did pretty well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I think trying to keep it an hour is usually about when people start teetering out. So. But yeah, it was good, it was good. Yeah, an hour, we're, we're talking five, less than five minutes per presentation. I think a lot of people would struggle to to describe the project succinctly. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I, I guess, if, unless anybody has any questions. Yeah, I'm going to. Oh, and uh, one, so yeah, one in the chat. For CSE 145, no, you don't need to submit to application form. Okay. Um, yeah. If you want to do one of the uh, E4A projects, uh, Ryan, how do you want yeah, to? Yeah, you should just contact the lead. So um, yeah, you don't need to submit, um, but you need to basically make sure that you have something to do. And so the, all the project leads should know about what CSE 145 is and what's going on. Most of them actually did it, have done it in the past. Um, so just reach out to them directly and uh, say, hey, you know, I'm from taking 145 and I need to decide on my project. Like, can I talk to you? Or can you let me know where, when the next meeting is? But yeah, don't, don't go through the application process for 145 because that'll take too long. You want, you want to get into a project quickly for that class. Yeah, my, my experience last year with helping out some 145 student groups, I just, uh, like I sat down, had a meeting with them early on, established what they wanted to do. And then we just, I helped them with their early assignment of laying out a roadmap of yeah exactly yeah complete yeah that'll be yeah that'll be due in like a week or two i can't remember exactly when but that's the forcing function for them is to um to write those reports milestones 
I have one last question. Um, how do you pick a project? There's so many <laughs> awesome opportunities and it's like, I have like, I don't know, it's all in my face and it's like, oh my God, this could be cool and this could be cool. And, and um, this is gonna be a tough choice. <laughs> I, I know that was somewhat rhetorical, but if you, uh, if you wanna talk mm -hmm. to any of us about your project, feel, feel free to reach out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely will be this upcoming week because this is a, yeah, all of these are so exciting. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, like I had a similar problem when I joined to E3. There was like three or four projects I was interested in. Just think about like what skills you want to develop, what topic seems interesting. And then I, I'd say probably the best indicator is just attending the weekly meetings of like maybe narrow it down to like sure. three or four projects you're interested in over the course mm -hmm. of spring, attend at least one and then uh, make your decision from that. Perfect. Yeah, well, I'm I, really excited to meet all of you and, and uh, get to know you and the projects better. So uh, it's gonna be um, it's gonna be a fun, fun summer. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, and, and one, one thing, um, and I, I would like to echo the, the suggestion, just, just attend a few of those meetings because not mm -hmm. only are, um, are the, the projects different in terms of kind of what their goal is, what kind of, what kind of skills you're going to learn and, 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 and all of that, but also they have, um, they're at like a different stage, right? Some projects have been going on for, for many years and some projects are, are newer, right? And so that may also kind of uh, impact a little bit um, like where do you feel more comfortable, right? If you want to want to jump in where there's kind of more open-endedness or where it's kind of, they have a very kind of clear goal in mind. Um, and mm -hmm. so you, you, you'll probably get a good feel for that if you, if you attend some of these, these project meetings and talk to the project leads, right? Where, mm -hmm. where exactly you can, you can fit in. But yeah, I mean, um, really happy to have you on board mm -hmm. and, uh, and be, be part of this this summer. And apparently, awesome. and, and, and hopefully before that. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, the big advantage I think of doing it early is that you mm -hmm. can you can try it out and you have time. So as opposed yeah. to in the past where you were like you really need to decide in like a week, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, right. Yeah, um, advantage of that. Actually, a follow up to um, all all of the leads actually is, I guess, what are you guys looking for when it comes to contributions? Are you guys looking for more of a balance? And this is to uh, Ryan and Kurt as well. Um, are we looking for more of like a balance of contribution and learning or like where, where does that balance fall on? Because I know we definitely want to make progress on the projects, but also the goal of picking up new skills and experiences mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah, I, I think I can kind of speak to that as a, as a director. And I think, um, of course, as a project leads, they want you to contribute right away, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but we realize that's not, that's not necessarily possible. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, if you can get through most of the learning curve before uh, the summer starts, you're probably going to get most out of it, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, how much time it involves really depends on like what you pick as a project, right? If you pick something that you're like, you know what, I know nothing about this and I want to make... Uh, I, I want to have a, a fun summer. Um, it's probably not going to be just um, just for yourself, right? If you're just learning something, not really applying it, it's not as fun for you either, right? So the the more you can kind of get to the point, you're like, you know what? I'm actually doing something useful now. If you get to that point by the start of the summer, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's probably good. And it's not that you will stop learning at that point, but it's more like you learn while they're actually developing something that is actually used in the project. Right. And before that, it's totally fine if, if you're just kind of picking up skills and like learning a programming language or what, what, what have you. Right. And that's kind of just kind of my, my perspective. Um, it's also kind of um, based on another summer program that we have. So the, SR, the SRP students. So there's, there's also students who basically are going to be part of the summer and are doing research in spring. And I've kind of mentioned the same thing. It's it's like if, the, if you come in with almost no experience, you probably want to kind of at least pick a project uh, before the spring starts and then mm -hmm. kind of go through most of that learning curve during the spring so that you basically they can contribute in summer. So that's, that's kind of the, the timeline we have 
for those students, right? Kind of make up your mind. Um, so that was kind of last quarter. So at this point, kind of like make up your mind, get to the learning curve. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, one thing I'll add just to your previous question is mm -hmm. each team has their own little dynamic. Uh, you know, each team is run a little differently. Each team kind of flows a little differently. And so you may well think about, you know, kind of what sort of environment you like to, to be in. Since you have, you know, you're going to have this chance to, you know, kind of feel out all, each of these projects. I would encourage you to, you know, kind of take a look at how you feel you fit best into each team as well. And let that also drive a little bit of your decision. Great. Perfect. Yeah. Plus, at a certain point, I think the, uh, the the learning comes from the contributions. Like you, you, you work on the project, and just the act of making those contributions, solving the problems you need to solve. That's mm -hmm. that's, in my experience, really where the learning happens. Okay. Cool. Great. I want to piggyback off what what Nathan said. Uh, a lot of us have our own kind of style or own approach to, man to managing the projects. Um, I don't think one is particularly better than the other, but I do think that, uh, you know, that you might feel like you fit in better with one, with, with one management style versus another. Sure. Sure. Cool. Well, great. Thank you all so much. Um, yeah, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that, so. Awesome. All right, I'll, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna run. Thanks yeah. again. We'll, we'll talk on, on Monday, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So yeah, Monday. Thanks said, everyone. So, yep, unless anyone has any, la any burning questions, I will kick you all out of this meeting now. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you all so much. Bye. Bye, everyone.